Hello and welcome to Mary Live. This is Dr. Mark Miravalli. My friends, I want to get into a little bit more of a personal uh, background history about how I got involved with something that's uh, very dear to my heart. It's a movement uh, that I've been participating in for over 30 years, a movement for the Fifth Marian Dogma, which is certainly not a surprise to our more consistent listeners and viewers. Uh, but I want to get into some of the personal background because it will also lead to a personal conviction uh, f that has lasted for over 30 years and will continue to last until I hear the words, God willing, from the mouth of the Holy Father, uh, the Vicar of Christ proclaiming this truth. Uh, what's the personal elements that I'm referring to? Well, uh, again, over the years, many people have asked, well, how did you get involved in this? And, and why did you get involved in it? And what was its role? So let me just briefly go back to the early 1990s. Uh, this was, if I remember correctly, January of 1992. And I was in Gaming, Austria as part of the abroad program for the Franciscan University of Steubenville. And I was doing a series of lectures, uh, which would later become uh, a small book called Introduction to Mary. And as I was reading the authors from the 30s and the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, uh, but principally uh, the 50s, 40s and 50s, the theme of a dogma, of a psalm definition of Our Lady's role of mediation, uh, of her role as co-redemptrix, mediatrix of all graces, uh, universal mediation, uh, kept coming up in the books, but this is the way it came up. It came up not if this happens, but when this happens. And this was confirmed not only by uh, a bunch of Mariologists, but it was also confirmed by Fulton Sheen and Carl Adam with the spirit of Catholicism and a number of just Catholic commentators saying, uh, again, not if, but, but when this dogma takes place. So I remember very specifically in my office in, in Austria, having a very strong burning in my heart and saying, well, what's happened to this? Uh, why has this not continued? And this led me to then have a meeting in spring of 1992 with a very saintly cardinal, uh, Cardinal Edouard Gagnon. He was a cardinal uh, from uh, Quebec, but at this point he was a curial cardinal in Rome. And so we had a lunch, actually it was a lunch with my whole family, and then later we met and it was uh, very re revelatory to me that he had himself submitted many bishops' petitions for this Fifth Marian Dogma to the Office of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. And so from that meeting, we resolved that we would uh, bring this movement back into uh, a fuller life, uh, both by petitions with the faithful uh, and with petitions from bishops. And that really became the origin of what was called a uh, Vox Populi Maria Mediatrici, a voice of the people for Mary Mediatrix. And it was rather stunning to me how this became a worldwide movement pretty much overnight. Uh, for example, I was speaking at a conference in St. Louis. One person came up and said, uh, oh, I've he heard, you know, you're in favor of the Fifth Mary Dogma. I'll take Australia for you. I'm Australian and I have a Marian center there. Another priest came up and said, oh, you've got to come down and talk to Mother Teresa about this. I'm close to Mother Teresa, and uh, she will love this. And as a result, I went down uh, in a month's notice to Calcutta, and Mother asked that the petition and the book for the Fifth Marian Dogma be sent to all of her, uh, if I remember correctly, 700 missionaries of charity houses throughout the world. Uh, and we certainly did that. I gave uh, six talks down with Mother in Calcutta, uh, in two days. And then again, it just it just exploded. People came forward and said, I'll take this country. Can I do it? It was clearly my, not my initiation. It, I believe it was truly of the Holy Spirit and Our Lady. Now, after meeting with Cardinal Gagnon um, and before uh, the full launch of the movement, uh, I also found out about Cardinal Mercier. Now, Cardinal Mercier was a cardinal back in 1915, and he had initiated this dogma movement. And again, as more consistent listeners uh, will know, we've talked about this in the past, he started the movement during uh, World War I, 
saying that if we acknowledge Our Lady, if we recognize, if we honor her with her role as uh, Mediatrix of all graces, spiritual mother, uh, including the foundation of that as co-redemptrix in the writings of Mercier, then she can fully exercise these roles for us. Uh, she can, uh, we've used the term now, you know, become empowered, but, but it's really a release of grace by us in our freedom, by humanity, by the church, acknowledging she can do this and she wants to do this and this, these are her roles. So it's, it's allowing her to fully exercise what she already is, what she already does, but on, on the optimum, maximum level. And for Cardinal Mercier, this was during World War I, so it was very important for him. He also saw that this dogma was essentially connected to world peace, that only when we acknowledge Our Lady's roles can she fully intercede for peace to stop World War I. And so I followed that history, and I found that was fascinating because I didn't know that uh, initially. I didn't even know it when I had talked to Carla Gagnon uh, in that spring of, of 92. And it was like, oh my gosh, this is really, this, we're not starting something new here. This is more like, you know, the Olympic runners who go from, you know, Athens to wherever the Olympics are held. This is really like just the last stage, taking the, you know, the Olympic torch from outside of the stadium and, and bringing it in. Uh, something that is only possible with all the work that's been done before. And so then researching that, it was phenomenal uh, that, uh, again, uh, Pius XI had two commissions, three, excuse me, three commissions established to study these questions, which produced, at least from the Spanish and the Belgian commission, uh, between 2,500 and 3,000 pages of support for this. And then in, in, uh, on December 1st of 1950, the International uh, Marian Association that, that gathered in Rome, what would become the Marianum, uh, unanimously voted for this just one month after uh, Pope Pius XII declared the dogma of the Assumption. So I'm, I'm amazed at this and, 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 and thrilled at this. Then and only then, only after those stages took place, did I hear about anything in the area of private revelation? But then from what became you know, at least a half dozen reputable private revelations, uh, the message was not only confirming what Mercier started in 1915, so obviously he was working with the spirit and the bride, but uh, underscoring that with this dogma would be expressions like a new redemption, a new release of graces like has hadn't happened since the first redemption with Jesus Christ as, as our divine redeemer and Mary is, of course, the human co-redemptrix. Expressions like healing would be brought to the, to the world through this. Uh, and uh, very strongly and repeatedly by several apparitions uh, that this is a condition for world peace because only peace can come from Our Lady because it's the task assigned to her by the Most Holy Trinity. Well, that was all the more encouraging that um, these uh, very reputable and at that time uh, approved apparitions uh, were also saying the same thing that Mercier was saying and the same thing that was really, you know, kind of summarized in these Mariological texts I was reading just in preparation for doing lectures for the Franciscan University over in, in Austria in their exchange program. So all of that brings to the fore the present situation. And that is, I believe Mercier was right. That peace will come through the world when we acknowledge Our Lady as the instrument of peace, when we honor her for that. I believe the uh, apparitions, uh, and by the way, as most know, I'm rather uh, famous or infamous for uh, calling out false apparitions. Uh, I don't like it. It's not a fun job to be a type of apparition cop, but I find false apparitions to be so very, very dangerous to the faithful. Uh, and so when I'm talking about, uh, you know, but a half dozen authentic uh, sources of truth, it's because they all meet the criteria of message, phenomena, and fruits and the criteria that's issued by the congregation. And so when they're talking about this, this historic release of grace and then I look at, and so believing these, and as I still do, and then looking at the world situation, which ironically, ironically, or perhaps not so ironically, but, but appropriately, 
Those same apparitions talking about the need for the dogma, uh, a great, uh, several of them, also prophesied the things we're facing right now, right in today's newspapers. And, and a series of prophecies that have all come true. Well, why do you think Our Lady gives prophecies? To give credibility to her message. So as we now look at the world scene and we see uh, unprecedented danger on so many fronts, I, I don't have to give you the laundry list. You, you, know, the, you know the general categories, the, the, the massive moral breakdown, the natural catastrophes, and the war possibilities, which, you know, Pope Francis has many times said we're already in World War III piecemeal, but now we're seeing it more, uh, I don't want to use the word vividly because that's too kind, uh, more tragically. We're seeing it more tragically in Ukraine and Russia, in uh, Israel and Palestine. You know, at this point, over 7,000, 7,000 women and children have been killed in, 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 in the Gaza Strip. Uh, again, that doesn't justify terrorism. Of course it doesn't. But the church always calls for proportionality. And, and that's not even as tragic as that is. That's not even what we're talking about in terms of global possibilities. Because everyone is allied to either Russia or Ukraine. Everybody is allied to either uh, Israel or Palestine. And there tends to be a consistency between those allies. That's what led to World War I, allies. That's what well could lead to World War III. I think, my friends, it's time to apply Pascal's wager to the message of these apparitions. What do I mean? Well, you know, Pascal's famous wager is, well, you know, if you're not sure that there's a God, you think about, you know, what do you lose if you live as if there is a God? Uh, and what do you gain if, in fact, there is truly a God? Well, let's use that formula to apply it to the, the consistent message of many of these beautiful, authentic, and really proven in the context of the prophecies being fulfilled, messages from Our Lady. So what happens if, to use Pascal's wager, let's ha what happens if all those apparitions are, are not true? Okay, what do we lose if we define that Our Lady is our spiritual mother? If the Pope makes a solemn declaration, including her roles, as co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate. And ultimately, you know, the Pope makes the final call on the formulation. Of course, that's his ultimate jurisdiction. But what do we lose? We don't lose anything. We're honoring Our Lady. We're honoring Our Lady profoundly. We're only speaking the truth. You know, I met one friend in Ireland who said, this is only the truth. What could go wrong with proclaiming the truth? Uh, we already believe these things. This is not a new invention. And so what could go wrong with going back to Cardinal Mercier, uh, forgetting all the apparitions and just saying, look, proclaiming the truth about Our Lady allows her in this order of freedom, which God so respects it. He's not going to force these graces on us. We have to ask for them. We have to exercise our freedom for them. We have to give, you know, really Our Lady our fiat so she can fully intercede for us. What's to lose for that? That's a beautiful thing. Now, some might say, well, it might cause ecumenical problems. It was fascinating. In that first response with Cardinal Gagnon, I made reference when we, we had a meal in Rome, with the family, and then it met afterwards. He said, I was alive when they brought forward all the objections to the dogma of the Assumption in 1949 and early 1950. 1950. You know what the major objection was? It would be terrible for ecumenism. And Cardinal Gagnon then said, Ecumenism never blossomed like it blossomed after the dogma of the Assumption. That led to the great ecumenical document in the Second Vatican Council. So when you include the mother, she's the one who brings unity. And I, I thought, he's so right with that. That's so true. And so the major objection could be, you know, it's going to hurt uh, ecumenical uh, relations. Well, first of all, if we're being true about what we hold, our Protestant brothers and sisters already know we hold this. Secondly, because it's the doctrine teaching the church, we can't deny it, nor should we ever deny it for some, what John Paul called pseudo-ecumenical activities. It's not real. It's fake. Uh, he literally says, who would accept Christian unity under 
so heavy a compromise as truth. Those words should stir us today because it's, it continues to be relaying the truth. That's the benefit we get even if all the apparitions are wrong. But what if the apparitions are right? What if world peace is really dependent on this dogma? We might say, I just don't get it. We don't have to get it. We don't have to understand all the, uh, uh, the intimate de details of why heaven wants truth proclaimed. It's enough. It should be enough that we know that heaven does want truth proclaimed. Jesus wanted truth proclaimed before he gave us the papacy. Only when Simon said, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build, build my church, only then did Jesus say, that didn't come from you, it came from the Holy Spirit, and now I'm going to give you the papacy. You are rock, on this rock I will build my church. Point. God loves it when truth is proclaimed. So he's going to love it when the truth about his mother is proclaimed. But if all these apparitions are true, the longer we delay in proclaiming the dogma of Mary as our spiritual mother, the longer, the farther away we will get from peace. And that means lives. This is not an ivory tower movement. This isn't just a nice kind of theological crossing of the T or dotting of the I's. It'd be nice to have a fifth dogma because then we'd be all done with Marian dogmas and uh, there's no dogma regarding, you know, Mary's relationship to us. Now that's true, but that's not ultimately why we're doing it. That's not the way we're moving it. That's not why 8 million people from 185 countries and slightly under 700 bishops and cardinals just in the last 20 years have petitioned the Pope to do this. It's because there's a deep, I believe, Holy Spirit-inspired conviction that we need to do this dogma. We need to honor our mother for peace to enter the world. As many, uh, even great leaders of Fatima have said, John Hafford, Howard D. in the Philippines, Courtney Bartholomew uh, in Trinidad, no dogma, no triumph. Unless this dogma is proclaimed, we will not have the triumph of the Immaculate Heart, which Our Lady has promised at Fatima. Now, on the positive dimension of these messages, she has also said, the dogma will be. Uh, one message says that the proclamation of Mary as co-redemptrix, pediatrics, and advocate is not a matter of man. It is a matter of God. And so the dogma will be. One message speaks about how the, the battle will be difficult, but the outcome is already assured. And again, th th these are several different sources from authentic uh, dimensions uh, which fill the church's criteria. So this is what has led me to a conviction. And my conviction is that as long as I live, I will pray and petition for the fifth Marian dogma. First of all, because I love our mother and she deserves it. Even if we weren't getting all these rather historic benefits, she deserves it. She deserves it a thousand times over. But secondly, it's also because I believe Mercier was right, and I believe the apparitions which confirm Mercier, and all the bishops that, uh, you know, there were over 300 bishops that asked Pope Benedict XV to define this before the end of 1920. I believe they were right too. I believe they were acting with the Spirit. The, the private revelation is only confirming what's already been in the church since 1915. So that's led me to this conviction that I will continue praying and petitioning until I hear the words, until I see the gold, until I see the crown, the figurative crown placed on our head, on the head of Our Lady, which is the fifth Marian dogma. So why all this? Because I invite you to join me. I know that some of you have the same stirring of the heart that I have, that this is true. I wouldn't take too much time in worrying about those who do not. Uh, that's an individual call. But you know what your heart is telling you. You, you know that the truth of these words, which are, you know, again, from the church, from Cardinal Mercy, and I believe from Our Lady's true messages, they, they, they stir our hearts. 
and they, they bring us to this. So I would start by saying, here's a couple suggested inventorial don'ts. This is all based on freedom, my freedom, and now, of course, your freedom. Don't get complacent about praying for the dogma in every prayer. That just means including in your rosaries, in your mass, when you receive the Eucharist, for the Holy Father and for the dogma. That's all they need. They, they don't need a, a readout. Heaven does, doesn't need a readout. Heaven knows exactly what you mean. For the Holy Father and for the dogma. In every prayer that you, that you pray. In every offering that you make. Uh, secondly, don't pray based on human assessment of probability. In other words, when we say, I, I just don't think this Pope is going to do it. Well, that's a human assessment when we're denying, at least by principle, the fact that prayer is supernatural. We're praying for conversion of heart. If, if there wasn't need for conversion of heart, we'd already have the dogma. I've said before, I think our lady's 10 months pregnant with this dogma. Um, and I, let me just insert here very briefly, since we're doing kind of historical dimension. I think the best objection to the dogma, the best objection, which is not a true objection, but it's, well, if the dogma were appropriate, St. John Paul II would have done it. He's such a great Marian Pope. I think that's the best objection in the sense of the most persuasive objection. I can tell you now, uh, and archives of the future will testify to this, I, so I say in great peace. John Paul II did want to proclaim the dogma. He did want to proclaim the dogma. He was stopped by two cardinals. The names of the cardinals and the positions of the cardinals are not important. Uh, that, can, that will come out in the archives in, in the proper time. But the Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, wanted this dogma proclaimed. As one bishop asked him why he wasn't proclaiming the dogma, he said, convince the cardinals, and I will do it. So it's not a real objection when you say, well, if it should have been done, John Paul II uh, would have done it. He wanted to do it. He was also uh, battling great things during his heroic papacy, including attacks on his papacy and towards the end of his life, even on his competency in light of his Parkinson's, which is utter nonsense, but that's what he had to do. So he made the prudential call uh, not to take that battle on at that time, but to say he didn't want the dogma is just not accurate. So the final inventorial don't, again, don't pray based on this, this human assessment. I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think he can do it. Our Lady keeps her, keeps her promises, and she's promised that this dogma will happen. And that's why we pray. We're not doing it based on a human assessment. We're praying because we're calling in supernature. And as we know, in response to Our Lady, with God, all things are possible. So let's pray out of faith and perseverance and of just pure love of the mother. She deserves our prayers. This is a fidelity call, not just a success, a success call. But the commitment I call you, I invite you finally, as we conclude, to join me in, is that you will continue praying until you hear the words. You will continue praying for the Fifth Marian Dogma until you see the gold. You will continue praying as consistently as you can. Every Mass, every Rosary, and offerings with the intention for the Holy Father and for the dogma. And then, my friends, we will be united as children of the Mother in fidelity in ways that I believe we will be eternally repaid. And even if it's not about eternal merit, uh, even if it's about first and foremost, as it should be, just what our mother deserves, let's do it for that. But I believe absolutely what Mert C.A. said and what the apparitions say, this dogma is a condition for world peace and it's getting darker and bleaker seemingly by the day. So let's pray. Talk about a wager that has no loss, that we're praying that the mother of Jesus will receive a crown that heaven wants her to have and that which is a condition, an instrument for peace Who's, you think Jesus can be upset about that one? Oh, no. Oh, no. He wants it, I think, even more than the mother. 
because he wants his mother acknowledged for her role in the history of salvation. And until that happens, we're not going to have the full peace. So let's end by praying the prayer of the Lady of All Nations, which is also an extremely efficacious prayer for this. But again, my commitment, I pray your commitment uh, for those who feel so called. Let's pray until we hear the words coming from the mouth of the Holy Father that our mother is declared, proclaimed, the spiritual mother of all peoples, the co-redemptrix, mediatrix of all graces and advocate. And let us pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Father, send now your Spirit over the earth. Let the Holy Spirit live in the hearts of all nations, that they may be preserved from degeneration, disasters, and war. May the Lady of all nations, the Blessed Virgin Mary, be our advocate. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks, and God bless you all.